what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the ancient names and give you many of the, the current names for it. Genesis chapter 10. Now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth were Gomer. Now they had a television program named after him, Gomer Pyle. <laughs> Gomer, Gomer is the father of the Welsh. And this is talking about Wales. Magog is in ancient Scythia. Magog is al also in a uh, designation of ancient Russia. Medei is where you get the name Medes from, the Medes. Javan is uh, the father of the Greeks. Tubal is, uh, is also a Russian um, city, which is now called Tobolsk, which does exist today. Meshach is modern Moscow. And Tyras, which is Thrace. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz. The Jews still in Germany, this is in Germany, are still called the Ashkenazi. Ashkenaz. Now the next name, uh, Rephath, is uh, in ancient Carpathia, which I'm not quite sure where that is. And Togarma is generally recognized as being Armenia. Now the sons of Javan were, and Javan, remember, being the father of the Greeks, were Elisha. Elisha is also translated Hellas. That's where you get the name Greek from. Tarshish has been recognized at most people as being ancient Spain. Kittim, which is Cyprus, and Doranim, which would be the Isle of Rhodes. From these, the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, everyone according to his own language, according to the families, into their nation. So you see Japheth as being the father of the Caucasians. Now the sons of Ham were Cush, which is ancient Ethiopia, Mizraim, which is Egypt, Put, which is Libya, and notice these are North African nations and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba, which is Sudan. Havila, Sabta, Rama, and Sade, uh, Sabdeka. And the sons of Rama were Sheba and Dedan, which are all in the Arabian area. Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, this is an in interesting person because he goes on and says in verse 10, it says, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, Kalneh, in the land of Shinar. The land of Shinar is ancient Babylon. From that land, he went to Assyria, which is 200 miles north of where he was in Babel, and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ur, Kela, and Rezin between Neve, Nineveh and uh, Kela, that is the principal city. Now, I'm not going to go very deeply into Nimrod, other than the fact that he's an interesting person. Uh, Nimrod's name means, let us rebel. That's what Nimrod means. The Bible says that he was a mighty hunter, and that word mighty hunter is not in reference to the way that he hunted animals. He was a hunter of people. That's what Nimrod was. He was a mighty warrior. And when it talks about Nimrod being a mighty hunter, it wasn't talking about the fact that he went out on these little fox hunts and killed fox. What this is in reference to is the fact that he was a vicious commander-in-chief, and he was out hunting people and destroying them. And it says that he began to be a mighty one on the earth. This shows the, uh, the incredible uh, strength of Nimrod. Now, he was such an incredible, powerful person that he's called a mighty hunter before the Lord. That word before the Lord does not mean that God was looking at Nimrod with favor. And, oh, look at Nimrod, what a powerful man he is. That word before in the Hebrew also means against the Lord. And Nimrod, by the basis of his name, which he was given, let us rebel, had a character of rebellion. And he was a vicious man. In ancient Babylon, he is recognized now as being the god Marduk, M-A-R-D-U-K, Marduk. And there were many legends that were built around this mighty hunter before the Lord, this vicious commander-in-chief of the armies who built Babel and Babylon, ancient Babylon, and was actually one of the originators of the Babylon, Babylonian religion. He was a man who went out and built cities, Babel being one of the most incredible cities of ancient world, and different cities, Erech, Akkad, Kalne, and the land of Shinar or Babylon. And he went beyond that land up to Assyria, and he built Nineveh, which you've heard of Nineveh before, uh, when, uh, 
we're told that Jonah was called to go up there and minister to these people. It was a very prosperous uh, city even in the time of Jonah. So it was a, as a powerful civilization. And he built Rehoboth, Ur, and Kelah, Rezin, between Nineveh and Kelah, that is the principal city. Nimrod is the type of the Antichrist. And you're going to see him more in chapter 11, but he's a type of the Antichrist, and he was looked upon in the Babylonian religion as being deified in the god Marduk. Now Mizraim, which represents Egypt, begot Mudim, Ananim, Lehabim, and Naphtuhim, which are Egyptian tribes, the Parthusim and Kasluhim, from whom came the Philistines and the Kaphtarim. Now Canaan begot Sidon. Sidon is uh, Phoenicia, which is in modern-day Lebanon now, his firstborn, and Heth. Heth is the father of the Hittites, and you see the Hittites mentioned several times throughout the scripture. It is believed that the Hittites fled east from where they were at that time and perhaps migrated into the Mongolian area and became uh, what we call today the Mongoloid race. The Jebusite, the Amorite, the Girgashite, the Hivite, Archite, the Sinite. The Sinite's an interesting name because it's the same where you get the word Sino from, S-I-N-O, and you, Sino is Chinese. And it appears that these people uh, were the originator of the Oriental religion, uh, excuse me, Oriental peoples, the Sinite. Arvidite, Zemurite, and the Hamathite. Afterward, the families of the Canaanites were dispersed. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as you go toward Gerar, as far as Geza. Then as you go toward Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, as far as Lashon. These were the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages in their lands and in their nations. Now this is the family of Shem. This is the Hebrew nations and the Semitics. And children were born also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber. Eber appears to be where we get the word Hebrew from, Eber. And this we're going to see is the main line of Abraham, the patriarch of the Jews. Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder. The sons of Shem were Elam, and you'll see the Elamites. Ashur, which is the Assyrians. Arphax, Ar Arphaxad, which I, I couldn't find that as a, a modern day translation. Lud is ancient Lydia, and Aram, which is uh, Syria. And the sons of Aram were Uz. <laughs> That's an interesting play. How'd you like it? Well, I come from Uz, you know, Calvary Chapel of Uz. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't make it, does it? Now, you'll, you'll notice Uz. <laughs> Uz is in Arabia, and when you go through the book of Job, Job is from the land of Uz. Um, there was a wizard there. <laughs> Hull, Gather, and Mash. Our fox had begot Salah, and Salah begot Eber. To Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, which means division. For in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Jokkan. And the earth was divided in the time of Peleg at Babel. We'll see this in chapter 11. Now Jokkan begot Almodad, uh, Shalep, Hazar Maveth, and Jerah. Hadaram, Uzal, Dikla, Ophal, Abamiel, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab. <laughs> Those are interesting names, huh? All these were the sons of Jokhan, and all of them are located in Arabia. And their dwelling place was from Mesha as you go towards Sephar, the mountains of the east. These were the sons of Shem according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, according to their nations. These were the families of the sons of Noah according to the generations in their nations, and from these the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. Now, the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, which is ancient Babylon, and they dwelt there in the Euphrates Valley. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. Now the reason that they wanted to bake the brick was to make a durable city, a city that would not fall, a city that would be permanent. 
as it is established. So they were baking brick rather than just throwing stones together. They took the time to erect what they considered to be a durable, permanent community. Now I want you to notice something that's taken place. God had already told them in chapter 9, verse 7, be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. God had told man to spread out and to multiply. But what man wanted to do is he wanted to remain together in community to follow after the lust of their own desires and their own heart. They, in other words, were already rebelling against the express commands of God. This shows you the human nature that we possess. What did they say? They said, let us, they, and they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. God wanted them to scatter, to populate the earth. But Nimrod, who is the builder of Babylon, and this is where they're at, being a man of authority and power, was contradicting, because his name means let us rebel, was contradicting the express purposes of God and said, no, we're gonna, if we scatter, we're going to lose a good thing that we have. Let's remain together. Let's build a, a permanent community. We'll burn some brick. We'll make some mortar. We'll establish a ziggurat here that can help us to, to uh, chart our destinies from the stars because that's what they're talking about, astrology. And we can remain here. Why leave? Nimrod, the mighty hunter against the Lord. You see, very often we get caught up thinking that these people were backwards people. They were not backwards people. They were created in the image of God. They had full capabilities of using this incredible brain God created them with. They weren't stupid. They didn't think that they could build a tower that would reach into heaven. They were building an astrological tower in order to chart the stars because though they knew God, their foolish heart became da uh, darkened and they ignored the express image of God that God had created with them, in them. They ignored God's working within their lives. According to Romans chapter 1 verses 18 following, the Bible says they knew God. <coughs> they knew Him. God had spoken to them. God had given them express design and they rebelled. So no, this isn't a product of some primeval brain that doesn't understand. This is a product of rebellious man attempting to, uh, to keep community without the Spirit of God. You know, it is impossible for us to be one in the Spirit if that Spirit is not from God, because we're rebellious by nature. I will constantly usurp your authority. I will constantly rebel against you and your wishes if we're not one in the Lord. And even when we're one in the Lord, very often my carnal nature provokes me to failure to, to, uh, to see eye to eye with you, even when you're right. So what they attempted to do here was they attempted to not follow God. They had left the Creator for the creation, and they followed after the stars, and they built ziggurats. And if you go into ancient Babylon, into that area, now there are many sites where the ziggurats still are, and you can see what man had done at a very early age in his history. But what happened? Even though Nimrod wanted to be a great dictator over the city of Babylon, the people, God in verse 5, it says, The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. That means he was visiting it in judgment. It's not as if God didn't know what they were doing. He came down in judgment. The Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. You know, in evil, when two evil people determine that they want to do something, they can accomplish quite a bit. When two evil people determine that they have the same goals, they can accomplish quite a bit. How about when two spirit-filled people agree on earth as touching anything? And I wonder if God wants us to understand the principle of unity here. Because what was taking place here was evil. And they were united in an evil purpose. And God said, they have one language. They understand each other's thoughts. And they're devising evil. They're going to accomplish it. I'm going to scatter them. I'm going to take the medium of communication from them so that they can't accomplish that purpose. You know, it's a blessing when we Christians can get together in one spirit in the Lord. How blessed it is when we can have the same heart and vision. Because when we agree on earth in the Lord, not to do what we want to do, 
Well, you know, I want a name for myself. I want a ministry with my name in it, you know. But when we just agree that we want God's reign on earth and we want God to receive the glory, and we yield ourselves to God and say, Jesus, you know, have your way, have your way. When we do that, God is blessed and his purposes are accomplished. So God sees this taking place here. He says, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us. Now he's not talking to the angels, naturally. He's speaking to within himself, which is the Trinity of God. Let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they had to cease building the city. And it would be natural. I mean, they're saying, can you hand me that, you know, what they've got a word for this particular tool. Give me the hoe there. And they use this incredible word. And before you know it, you know, they don't know what's going on. Somebody's using a word for brick, and somebody's not understanding that. Somebody's speaking German. Somebody's speaking French. Somebody's speaking Italian. Somebody's speaking possibly an ancient English kind of language. I mean, they're just, nobody is capable of understanding each other, and they just scattered naturally. They found people. You know, we will find somebody who communicates in the same level as us, and we will gravitate to somebody. I don't care where you're at. You know, it's funny, how, and I didn't mean to say this, but it's true. When you travel the world, when you go into another country, go into Germany, and everybody speaks German, you will gravitate to an American. And you know, a lot of your what you at one time thought was cool, well, these are the cool people I want to hang around with, that's gone. What you look for is somebody who can speak English. And you don't care if he speaks with a southern accent or a Brooklyn accent. You don't care about any of these silly things that we carry inside of our hearts. We would just look for somebody who can communicate with us. And you'll, you'll walk around if you find some, and then you'll pal around with them. When I traveled, I traveled Europe for three months. And as I went through Europe, I found myself gravitating to people who could speak my language. And that's what you'll do. And then you develop relationships amongst people who can speak your language. And that's what happened here. So they all gravitated to somebody they could communicate with, and this was capable, this made it possible for the earth to be spread out and populated. Now, in verse 9, it says, therefore, speaking of the city, therefore, its name is Babel. Babel means confusion, and that's ancient Babylon. Because there, the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Now, we'll go into verses 10 uh, following into what is called the uh, basic genealogy. This is the genealogy of Shem. And the reason Shem's genealogy is, is held up is because Jesus Christ's line came from, Sh from Shem, Jesus being Semitic. Shem was 100 years old and begot Arphaxad two years after the flood. After he begot Arphaxad, Shem lived 500 years and begot sons and daughters. Arphaxad lived 35 years and begot uh, Salat. After he begot Salah, Arphaxad lived 403 years and begot sons and daughters. Salah lived 30 years and begot Eber. After he begot Eber, Salah lived 403 years and begot sons and daughters. Eber lived 34 years, begot Peleg. Uh, after he begot Peleg, Eber lived 430 years and begot sons and daughters. Peleg lived 30 years, begot Ru. After he begot Ru, Peleg lived 209 years, begot sons and daughters. Ru lived 32 years, begot Serug. After he begot Serug, Ru lived 207 years, he begot sons and daughters. Serug lived 30 years, begot Nahor. After he begot Nahor, Serug lived 200 years, begot sons and daughters. Notice that people are living uh, less years. Nahor lived 29 years, begot Terah. After he begot Terah, Nahor lived 119 years and begot sons and daughters. Now Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. This is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram. Now, Abram is who we know now as Abraham. His name originally meant high father. This is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran begot Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans. Then Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. Now, it's going to be important for you to notice something. Some of these things I could just go through, but I think it's important. Sarai means contentious or dominative. So you're going to see that in Sarah's personality. See, she was Sarai first, and she became Sarah. She was a contentious woman before she became a princess. You're going to be seeing this. And I just want you to note. Now, Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, 
and the father of Iska. Iska is a lady's name, it means observant. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now there's a whole lot involved here, and hopefully as I get into verse 4 of chapter 12, I'm going to make some interesting statements. Because what you're seeing here is Terah, who has lived 70 years and then has Abram. Terah died at the age of 205 years of age. That made Abram um, 135 years old, would that be 135? 135, when his father died. But you're going to note in verse 4 of chapter 12 that God called Abram to leave at the age of 75 out of uh, Haran. And that's an interesting thing when you get into some of the basics here because God's original call came to Abram to come out and to be separate from his kindred. But he didn't. He went with his father, with Lot, and you're going to see that he didn't separate himself. I'll go into chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, and, and, and kind of give you some interesting things about this. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your kindred, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Because the Messiah was to come from the line of Abram, this is what he was referring to, in you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because Messiah comes from Abram's line. Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Now, God had originally, let's turn to the book of Acts, chapter 7. God called him when he was in Ur of the Chaldees. But there appears to have been some form of delay that took place from the original call to when he ended up in a city called Haran. Haran means delay. And there's a delay of some sort that took place in the life of Abram. Now Stephen was given his defense, Stephen the first martyr. And in verse 2 of Acts chapter 7, he said, Men and brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to the land in which you now dwell. Now here's your problem. God called him in Genesis chapter 12 verse 4 to leave and he departed Haran at the age of 75. But Stephen is saying, that he didn't leave until his father was dead. His father died at the age of 205, which would have made Abram 135 years of age. It's a 60-year discrepancy, and how do you deal with that? Now, see, I could have just read this and not even told you about the Acts 7 passage, huh? And you'd have been reading Acts one day, and you'd have said, now, wait a minute. How come Genesis 11 and 12 seem to contradict what Acts is talking about? So there's a couple ways to deal with this passage I want to give to you. One is this. In the Bible, very many times, you will find, you will find the youngest son, if he's important, placed in ahead of the firstborn son. You see that happening in the blessings of, uh, of Jacob and Esau, when Jacob was born after Esau but received the priority of blessing. Manasseh and Ephraim, Joseph's sons, when there was a blessing that Jacob gave to him, the younger was blessed over the older. And sometimes in the Old Testament, you will see the younger being spoken of as prior to the older, even though the older one was in actuality born before and should have received prior recognition. There are those who believe that Abram was the youngest and he was born 60 years after the firstborn son, which would have made him 135 years of age, uh, which would have made up for that 60-year discrepancy there. I don't agree with that. I think what's happening here, and see if I can make this clear, I think in all intents and purposes, as far as God was concerned, Terah was as good as dead in his relationship to God. When you look into Joshua chapter 24, verse 2, 
There's an interesting remark made about Terra. It's a very simple one. It says, Terra worshiped other gods on the other side of the Euphrates. And it would appear that God had spoken to Abram when he was still in Ur of the Chaldees and told Abram to leave, and his father attached himself to go along with him. But his father didn't enter into the full promises that could have been his because in his disobedience, he remained behind in a city called Haran, which means delay. And he delayed and remained there and died there. And it appears already that Abram had tarried long enough and he shouldn't have even have stopped in Haran. He should have continued on into the promises that God had given to him, but he remained behind for his father's sake, it appears, in the scriptures. And I think that's how you deal with that. I think what happened is as good as, uh, that is, 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 is Terah was as good as dead in the economy of God when he embarked in his disobedience to remain behind. God had called Abram, come on out and depart from your family, and Abram had moved originally, had held off for a little while, and then fulfilled this promises of God. Now, you're gonna notice something. Be careful as you study the lives of our saints, quote unquote, these holy men of God, that we don't idealize them into perfection. They were human beings and they were just as disobedient as you and me. And you're gonna see this in chapter 12 and you'll see it through the life of Abraham, that he was just as disobedient as you and me, that it was God's mercy that reached down and took him and made him into a man of God. Not some hidden quality in him that God said, this man is a premier man above all men. It was God's grace that called Abraham in the same way as God's grace that calls you. And I believe what happened was that, is that Terah delayed, Terah remained, Abram moved out and moved into the promises of God, and as far as God was concerned, he had stopped working with Terah and worked specifically in the life of Abram. Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, which still represents an impartial obedience, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. And so they came to the land of Canaan, which was a 400 mile trip southwest of where they were at in Ur of Chaldees, in Haran that is. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, which is modern day Samaria, as far as the terebinth trees of Moreh. And the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. You're going to notice something in a little while. He built an altar there to the Lord. And he moved from there to the mountains east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord for guidance and in worship in Bethel. Now this was the place where Abram was relying on the direction of God. I want you to think of that for a moment as we continue on. Now there was a famine in the land and Abram went down to Egypt. Now God never told him to, there's no indication here that God said go down to Egypt. And watch what happens. There was a famine in the land and Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there for the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Now she was 65 years old. A 65-year-old fox. <laughs> Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, this is his wife, and they'll kill me, but they will let you live. Well, he had forgotten God's promise. God had said, out of you, I'm going to make a great nation. Notice what happens when you're starting to move a little bit out of the will of God. You're moving out of the will of God. So right away, he is in the position of beginning a compromise, okay? He's already telling them, hey, we'll lie. Now, actually, they weren't lying. Later on, you'll find out she was his half-sister, and it is a partial truth. But what was really at the root of this was compromise. And he was forgetting God's provision. Please say you're my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. This is his human frailty and his compromise. So it was, when Abram came into Egypt, that the Egyptians saw the woman, that, uh, that she was very beautiful, and the princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. Now, because of Sarai, the Bible says he treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Now, God is keeping Pharaoh from marrying Sarai and ruining the line of promise that God had established, okay? 
Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now, therefore, here's your wife. Take her and go your way. Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Now, I want you to notice this. Abram came in as a man of faith, a man of God, a man who knew God. God had appeared to him. He had set up a couple altars already. God had made incredible promises. And I picture Abram as trying to convert Pharaoh, talking about what a marvelous God that he serves, and all along compromised in his faith. God never allows us to get away with that. And notice the rebuke where it comes from. It comes from a heathen. God, you know, have you ever been rebuked by a heathen? I thought you were a Christian. You say that you're a Christian man, but you, you, you know, you lied. You told the boss that you were sick, but you told me that you weren't. You said that your car broke down on the way to work, but in reality, you didn't. Have you ever been rebuked by a heathen? How does it deal with your uh, witness? It's kind of bad, isn't it? I've been rebuked by him before. And it just stings. It stings worse than when a brother rebukes you. When a brother rebukes you, you can say, you're self-righteous. <laughs> <laughs> when a heathen rebukes you, you're rebuked. And that's what happened. <laughs> I think Abram blew his chance of converting the Pharaoh of Egypt by this ungodly behavior of lying like that. So off he goes with his tail between his legs. Now you're going to see what happened in compromise. It affected his relationship with Lot. Abram went up from Egypt. He and his wife and all that he had and Lot with him to the south. Abram was very rich in livestock in silver and in gold and he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel. Now that was where he had begun. Remember when he sought the Lord in guidance and had made that altar and called upon the name of the Lord? He went back to Bethel. God is always open to us returning to him and seeking him and saying, God, forgive me, I blew it. Abram went back to Bethel, and he went to a place of his communion with God, and I believe that's what that represents. He went back to Bethel, to that altar, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. But the ramifications of his compromise are going to live on. He went to the place of the altar which he had made there at first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord again, and God is always faithful to forgive us when we come to him in true repentance. Lot also, who went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them, that they might dwell together. For their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. And they were watching the strife between these godly men and their, their shepherds. What had happened? Lot lost respect for Abram. He saw the compromise. He would never have dared to stand against his uncle, such a great man of God, had his uncle not blown it. This is the ramification of blowing it when you compromise. Is it always, you, might, you might find peace with God, but there are waves that are still going because of that rock you dropped in the pond. And this is what's happening here. There's strife. Abram said to Lot, please, let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen for we're brethren. Abram has to humble himself to his own nephew. And that's a ramification of his compromise. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I'll go to the left. Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. Now this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. You go to Sodom and Gomorrah now, you don't find it. It's not there anymore. It's at the bottom of the Dead Sea. <laughs> There's nothing there. Nothing lived there. But this was before it was destroyed, so it was beautiful and lush, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go towards Zor. So what did Lot do? Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abram really should have had first choice over the land. He was the patriarch. He should have said, we've got too much going against us. Lot, take off that way. I'm going to go this way. But he deferred to his nephew, and he allowed him to make a choice. But because Lot, I believe, was in an ungodly state, 
He, what his eyes saw, he wanted. Man, check that out. It's beautiful. It's like the Garden of Eden that I've heard about. I'll just live down there. And he didn't, you don't see any indication of them seeking God at all. He just went. So off he goes. But where did he go? Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. He's not in Sodom. He's in the outskirts of Sodom. I want you to watch backsliding as it takes place. Right now, he's on the outskirts of Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. The backslide begins with the lust of the eyes. He saw something that he liked, and he moved there thinking, I'm a righteous man, I can handle anything. But God says the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord, and watch what happens. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent, and he went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. Notice his devotion to God. God said to him that everything you see is going to be yours, and I'm going to give it to your descendants forever. That descendant is literally to your seed. The seed is in reference to Jesus Christ, and Galatians tells us about that. He's not speaking specifically of the physical, literal seed of Abram. He's talking about the spiritual seed that enter into the promises of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And he's saying, I'm going to number your seed. Now, when he says it's going to be like the dust of the stars, all he's using is, is, is a reference of the numbers. He's not saying, you know, you're going to have multi-billions. But what he is saying is that you are going to be very, have a lot of children who will follow after and call back and look at your name, Abraham, as father. Now, in verse four, in chapter 14, it says, it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, or king of Babylonia, Ariok, king of Alasar, which was southern Babylon, Chedo, Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, which is modern-day Persia, and Tidal, king of nations, which is northeast Babylonia, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Chinab, king of Adma, Shemember, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is now called Zoar. All these joined together in the valley of Siddim, which is now called the Salt Sea. Now, this was before there was a Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Chedor Laomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Chedor Laomer and the kings that were with him came and attacked the Rephaim in Ashtaroth Karnaim, which is south Syria, the Zuzim in Ham, the Emim in Shaveh Kiriathaim, and the Horites in the mountain of Seir. As, uh, as far as Al Paran, which is by the wilderness, which is about 30 miles southeast of the Dead Sea. And you saw that they came from the north and traveled all the way south, and they were fighting giants and different peoples as they came down. The point is, Chedo Leomer and this confederation had some incredible armies, and they were very fierce. And they were wiping out all these giants. The Zuzim and Mim were giants. It says the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, Excuse me, I'll go back to verse 7. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, which is Kadesh, and attacked all the country of the Malachites and also the Amorites who dwelt in Hazizan uh, Tamar. And the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out and joined together in battle in the valley of Siddim against Chedor Leomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of nations, uh, Amraphel, king of Shinar, area, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddim, which is the Dead Sea, was full of asphalt pits. And the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, all their provisions, and went their way. They also took Lot, Abraham's brother, who dwelt in Sodom. Now he had moved his tent from the outskirts into the city and got ripped off who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, this is the first time Abram's called a Hebrew, the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, the Amorite brother of Eshcol and brother of Aner, and they were allies with Abram. Now, when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan, which is in the northernmost border 
of Israel. Notice that 318 men were born in his own family and his servants. Now that's quite a, that's quite a large, that tells you how rich he was. He divided his forces against them by night. And he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot. Now that's just the term, his brother Lot is not reference to his brother, actually it was his nephew. And his goods as well as the women and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him. You see, God gave to Abram the victory here. He didn't have the opportunity or the possibility of having a victory against this incredible army. But God gave to Abram the victory because God will always give you the victory when he's on your side. And the numbers that you have on your side have nothing to do with the numbers against you. With God, you're in the majority. And so off they went. And they had victory. So the king of Sodom went out. Now this king of Sodom had fled. Why wasn't he with him? <laughs> he was hiding in the asphalt pits. The king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of, of Chedorlaomer, and the kings were with him. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of, the, of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, speaking of Abram, gave him a tithe of all. Who is Melchizedek? Nobody really knows. Go through the book of Hebrews in chapter 7 especially. There's an awful lot said about him, but it's all in reference to a type that he is. He's like Jesus Christ. He brings out bread and wine, which is a type of the body and blood of Christ. And he's such a great individual. He's called the king of Salem, and his name Melchizedek means um, king of righteousness. And he was somebody that was so incredible that Abram recognized this man and gave to him a tenth of what he had. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. Now, I love Except what only what the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me, Aner, Eskel, and Mamre. Let them take their portion. What's he saying here? I'm not going to give man an opportunity to glory in what God has done in my life. I'm not going to beg you for a single thing. I won't even take a, a shoelace. In ministry, that's something God has taught us. There have been people in the history of our small fellowship once in a while who want to give to us things. And it's something God has tried to teach us, that he is the one who sustains this ministry. I really, I really believe that you need to pray for us that we never get tempted to fall into the trap of begging for finances from man. And you know what I'm talking about. I mention it often. If you don't give, this church is going to fold. And I start telling you that. And, 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 you know, we've got our radio ministry, and you've got to support that. And we've got this land coming up, and you've got to support that. And we've got families and all this stuff. Because if we ever begin begging for finances, this ministry deserves to die. I think it should die because we've lost sight of the fact that God owns the ministry. And if God owns it, he supports it. And I really do believe that. I believe that when I start coming up here hyping for money, it's time for me to take a vacation and get close to God. Because anybody who begs you for support, watch out. Because if God is in it, God will provide for it. God will provide for it. Chuck tells us a story that has been embedded in my heart for a long time. When they first began their ministry, a man came and offered him a million dollars in a time that it was an incredible need in their ministry. A million dollars. And he was so excited about the possibility. All he could do, we could pay off the land and we can do so much for it. And God said, yes, but I'm doing a work here that I want all the glory for. And if you take that million dollars... Even though it's, uh, it's a free gift and the man is a godly man who wants to give it and doesn't want his name attached to it. What will happen in the future when this ministry is evaluated is people will say, yes, isn't it neat that somebody gave them a million dollars and bailed them out in a time of financial need? God said, wait on me and I'll show you my hand. So the next day, Chuck said, in a very disappointing way, said to the man, you know what? Give your money to somebody else. And yet God blessed Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, in such a way that no man can take the glory for it. 
and it is an incredible ministry that God erected and God sustained, and it's all to God's glory. If I ever come up or anybody in this ministry ever comes up and starts begging you for finances, then you rebuke us for it and warn us because that's a sure sign that I'm not listening to God anymore. I'm listening to man. And when I start hyping for cash, then I'm out of the will of God. Because if God guides, God provides. God always does. Abram taught us that lesson, not Chuck Smith. Abram taught us. He says, I'm not, he said, man, I swore to God. I lifted up my hand to the God of heaven and I said, I will take nothing from you. Lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. Man doesn't make you rich. God blesses you.